Yeah, hello everybody, Brad with The Guitologist here, and in this video we're going to take a look at a mid to late 1960s Kalamazoo Reverb 12. Uh, the Kalamazoo Reverb 12, as the name indicates, is approximately 12 watts. It has two EL84 power tubes in the power section, uh, probably actually closer to about maybe 14 or 15 watts. Um, we see here on the front, we have a couple of instrument inputs. Uh, we have loudness, treble, uh, with the on and off switch on the treble, bass, frequency, depth, reverb. You can see here there's no um, knobs on here at the moment. We have replaced grill cloth. Uh, this is something that a customer brought me. We're going to uh, take a look at and go through completely. Um, as look at the back here. <clears throat> the back panels are off at the moment. The speaker has been replaced with a Weber Ferromax Vintage Series. We see our spring reverb tank down here. Um, the electronics are open up here at the top. And this thing has, someone has been in here, I believe. I think this can may have been replaced. There's some, there's some t zip ties here, but that might also be um, factory. Not really sure at the moment. The orange drop caps that are in there uh, all look original to me, as does as does this uh, capacitor in the back. Uh, we'll see here on the back panel, the upper back panel, if I insert it here, we have uh, uh, an 8 ohm speaker output auxiliary. Uh, we also have a phono and tape input for this amp. So this is around a time period when they were thinking about uh, trying to appeal to multiple customers. We also have a an auxiliary AC outlet. Uh, again, this thing uses two EL84s. They are, have been replaced. All the tubes have been replaced by JJ's. Uh, looks like we have three preamp tubes as well and solid state rectification. Uh, we're going to go through this thing. Um, we'll fire it up at first, bring it up on a Variac, see exactly what it's doing or not doing. Um, and then we'll kind of go through and see what needs to be done. If that sounds like something you'd be interested in, stick around. Okay, here we are with this Kalamazoo out on the bench, and uh, I notice a few things right off the bat. Um, this is definitely not original. Uh, someone has drilled holes in the chassis to accommodate uh, this cap can on the inside. Uh, we may or may not replace that. This looks pretty old. It looks like maybe it was reused from something else. Um, we also probably should check this against the schematic since it's already been monkeyed with. We have a 40, 40, 20, and 20 in this one. Um, and I don't know if this is, you know, what it originally called for or not. Um, notice a couple of other changes. This cap is almost certainly, uh, changed, I would, I would have to say. Um, that I believe is, that's a Japanese part, I'm pretty sure. Um... This cap can is probably original stills, which will most likely need to be replaced. We have left the death capacitor in place, even though we have a three-prong cord. Uh, somebody did wire in the cord, but didn't remove the death cap. A couple little solder flakes down there, which will sweep all that stuff out. Um, just looking around in here, I don't think there's anything else really that pops out at me. Um, these some of these capacitors may have to go um, I'll put a tester on those and see but uh, usually those those hold up okay and these Gibsons or well I say Gibson Kalamazoo same difference um, another thing I notice uh, we do have a date code on the reverb tank of um, 28th week if we can zoom in there the 28th week of 1966 uh, unfortunately, the grommets on this reverb tank have completely deteriorated, so the, the reverb tank is just basically holding on to the, to the screws. You can see there, it's just, I mean, it just comes right off, so there's nothing really, um, you know, absorbing any of the shock uh, of, of uh, you know, music coming into this thing onto the reverb so you probably get a lot of noise out of this reverb I would imagine so we'll probably pull this tank out of here and uh, affix some new grommets um, rubber grommets in that 
Also, I noticed that the layout is just kind of weird. Um, we have our two power tubes are back here in the back. And so they're the first things that you see when you look in the back of the amplifier. All of the preamp tubes are way up front, so you have to reach way down inside to, to get to the preamp tubes. So it's a little bit odd on the layout. We do have the original uh, foot switch here. I think we may have already shown that, but this is the original one. Um, we also have the uh, knobs and everything in a bag here that were in the bottom of the amplifier. Uh, there were a couple gator clips clipped onto the speaker. Um, the wires were not soldered on to the speaker either, so um, we're going to solder those back in when we get it back in, or maybe even put terminals on it. We'll see, but, um, but yeah, just preliminarily, uh, that's, that's what we're looking at right now. I guess let's probably go ahead and uh, plug this into the Variac, uh, hook it back up to the speaker, and um, slowly dial it up and take some measurements and see what's going on. Well, upon further examination, uh, these are definitely going to have to go. This can is not stable in here, and look at how close the terminals of this can are to the um, auxiliary terminals on this AC line. Look at that. I mean, one false move, and this thing might get over there to that AC line. Very, very close. Really too close for comfort for me. So this, this thing's going to come out of here. This really isn't something I ever would have done anyway. I mean, our modern capacitors are, are small enough um, that we should be able to get some in here with, with ease and not have to do something like this. Uh, this capacitor over here actually has already been clipped out upon further examination. There are two uh, leads coming off of there. So this is probably a, it's probably a dual section capacitor. The black lead is still connected, which would be the common uh, but we're just going to go ahead and clip this complete, get this completely out of here. That's going to free up a little space as well. I've already clipped out the um, uh, the death capacitor, so that's already out of the amp. So let's go ahead before we even turn this thing on. Before we do anything at all, we know these caps are going to have to go. So let's go ahead and get this thing out of here, and let's get this thing out of here. Let's get a schematic and figure out exactly uh, what's supposed to go where, and uh, and we'll take it from there. Alright, so first things first, uh, let's get this one out. I'll move my leads here. Um, usually these can be broken with just a little bit of movement back and forth. This one is kind of long, so it might take, a, might take a second to get this one out of here, but we're going to clip this common wire, the black. Let's see if we can twist this thing out of here. That's usually what I end up doing more times than not. So, make sure we're not breaking any connection, other connections in here. Well, this one's a bit stubborn. Sometimes they are. Usually just moving them back and forth like this works them. There we go. And it just works it right off of the uh, little rivet that's in there. <clears throat> some old tape in there for some reason. And let's check out this cap. Let's see what we have here. We have a multi-section cap with 220 microfarad at 450. So we know for sure we're going to need those. 1966, 28th week, 235, which is Mallory made in USA. So there's our old cap. We could probably even strip these wires back and see how bad this cap was, but I mean, that's academic at this point. So let's set that aside and we've got this space freed up and let's get rid of this. It should be easy enough. Let's see. I'll just clip this thing out of here. Whoever put it in and drilled some holes in the chassis to accommodate for it and they, and they have some pretty razor sharp edges and stuff hanging off the bottom I noticed. Let's get rid of those. Let's see. This cap can is using, it has four sections but it's using three of those sections. And let's see what it's what it is using. It's using the triangle, the half moon, and the square. 
So it's using 40, 40, and 20. All right. Well, first things first, let's see. I should be able to clip this common off of here. This is all common, that's common. So yeah, we can definitely clip that off of there. Our common wire. Uh, the one that's 20 is the triangle. And that's this guy. Right there. Just trying to take note of where things were. That way we can put them right. So there's that. And these two were 40s. And what I'll probably do on these 40s, I'll clip those off and just kind of tie them together. So I'll know which, which two were the 40s and which one was the 20. Well, I mean, we may end up redoing this anyway. I just want to know what was taken out. So there we go. Those two were the 40s, uh, and that one was the 20. So here's the other one. This is from 1976, so this is a later capacitor, 38th week, uh, and it's also a Mallory. Uh, as you can see here, it's got a couple of 40s at 500 and two 20s at 500. Um, this will also be replaced, of course. And just for giggles, we could probably uh, check it later, too. We'll set it aside for now. Okay, so there's those capacitors out of the way. Okay, here's a schematic that I found online for the uh, Kalamazoo Reverb 12. Uh, this schematic, first of all, was produced by a man named Miles O'Neill in Austin, Texas. And uh, we thank him for that. appreciate that. Um... It says for some reason this is version B, so I'm not sure. Maybe they made more than one version of this amp. Um, but this looks, uh, as far as the layout goes and the tube complement uh, and everything, this appears to be pretty much the same amp. Um, here's the power section over here. We see a 40, uh, 40, or excuse me, a 40, a 20, and a 20. Uh, whereas um, whoever put in that 1978. Mallory big cap can they actually used a 40 a 40 and a 20 rather than 40 20 20 So we were going to change that back uh, We will check their resistor values that they used in the power rail and see if those are correct or at least close um, And uh, let's see what else uh, We see that the tremolo is the uh, it modulates the output and I know tremolo I say tremolo. Uh, most of the people uh, who subscribe to my channel and they've made this very vocally clear say tremolo. Uh, I refuse to say it that way because I've always said tremolo and I'm always gonna say tremolo. So there's that. <laughs> so um, at any rate, yeah, this modulates the um, the grid bias on the output tubes uh, through in this manner. Uh, what do we have here? The the tape and phono actually comes in the same place as the instrument input, so there's no extra stage for it or anything like that. Uh, we use two halves of a 12AX7 for reverb, uh, one on the primary side and one on the uh, after the tank on the uptake, and it gets injected back in uh, after the treble and loudness controls and the bass control so the tone after the tone stack and loudness it gets injected back in which is all this is all pretty standard stuff um, I don't think uh, we're gonna have any problems with the preamp or any of this other stuff um, at least not that I recall he I think uh, the customer who owns this amp did maybe mention a problem with the tremolo so we will check that out and see what's going on with that of course we have that problem with the tank the reverb tank that we need to look at. Um, he did replace all the tubes, so the tubes should at least be good. But as for right now, what we need to do is go ahead and stick these uh, filter caps in, check the uh, resistor values to make sure that those are correct, and then we'll go from there. Okay, a couple of things about this power rail that were off. Uh, first of all, this, this 1K resistor right here in this position 
uh, which is right uh, after the first filter capacitor. Uh, it's supposed to be 1K. This one is a 1.5 that was in there. So we're going to remove this and replace it with a 1K. This one is correct. Uh, but we'll see here. Uh, here are the bands indicating the negative um, terminals on the diodes and they are joined together here. Well if we look over here where the negative terminals uh, come off, we're su that's supposed to be our positive terminal for the 40K. However, uh, the lead that's coming off of there is the one that went to the 20K. So our, we had a 20K up front and then we had two 40Ks after after that so instead of instead of 40 20 20 we had 20 40 40 so so yeah all right we have our new power rail installed uh, with the 1k resistor uh, 47 microfarad capacitor uh, which they don't make 40s anymore 47 is about as close as you're going to get uh, and a couple of 22s and this should be a lot better than what we had. And I just put everything up here on this, and you can see, I mean, that's a hell of a lot cleaner than what was in here at the start. Because uh, we had that big, giant can back here, and then we had that one up front. And that's, that's a heck of a lot cleaner right there. Puts all the power stuff right in one area. Here's another thing you got to look out for if you're going to um, do this kind of work. Um, it's usually a little bit more of a pain in the ass. Uh, to come in after someone has already fiddled with um, an amp than it is to just you know do it when it's virgin. Um, this is a good case in point. Uh, here we have the black wire uh, coming in from the power cord and the black is hot. Uh, here the black is going to this terminal and you can see here it's going directly through uh, the primary of the transformer. So that's not what we want. We want the we want the hot to go through uh, the switch. Uh, well, first of all, we want it to go to the uh, to the fuse, and then to the switch, and then through the transformer, and then the return uh, should come out of the out of there, and then go to the neutral. But this is backwards, uh, and we're gonna fix that right now. All right, we're firing this thing up for the first time on a Variac, and. Uh, we are going to check out the voltage at the first power no node while we're at it. Right now we have it dialed up uh, where the voltage at that point is about 80 or so volts. Uh, we don't have any light on our... At least I don't see it. Our light won't come on for another minute or two. We'll dial it up a little bit more here. And we're up to about 150 volts or so. We'll let it sit there for a second or two. Looks like we're starting to get maybe a little bit of light. It's kind of hard to tell. There we are up to about 200. And we're beginning to get sound out of the speaker. And of course, it's always going to be a little bit more uh, noisier because, I mean, I'm using a, um, a fluorescent light right above this amp and there's no shielding. So uh, it's always going to be noisier out on the bench than it will be probably back in the cab. Go ahead and dial it up a little more. See how high that voltage gets. It's only about 310 volts at that first node, so not all that high, really. A 
light's definitely on now. Let's see if we get any uh, anything out of the tremolo or reverb. Doesn't seem to be anything uh, coming out of the tremolo, so we may have to end up replacing some of the tr uh, replacing the tremolo caps. Um, but that's no big deal. Um, we'll look into that a little further here in a moment. But let's check out the reverb. Reverb works. There's reverb up. There's reverb down. I can definitely hear the echo. Uh, we're gonna have to do something about this tank once again, uh, but the reverb does work. Um, the tremolo, however, is gonna need some service, so we'll look into that next. Here are the, the three capacitors uh, in the tremolo right here, and that is these three right here on the schematic. Uh, this 22, this 20, uh, this 022, and this .01. So these three capacitors are these guys. Uh, we can see here uh, on the plate we're going to have some about 105 volts, um, but we are isolated by this cap and this cap at this this position. And I think this cap right here is my prime suspect uh, for why we're not getting any kind of oscillation with the depth all the way up. Unless there's a problem in the switch, which is which is possible also, but I'm going to bridge across this cap and see what happens. Let's see. Let's get a. We're going to need a 0 .01 capacitor, so let's grab one of those <clears throat> and let's just uh, bridge it in temporarily, just to see what happens. does not appear to be making any difference whatsoever uh, so we may as well go ahead and replace all three of those and uh, we'll figure it out okay I've replaced the three capacitors uh, in the um, tremolo section and uh, it still didn't fix it uh, but just out of curiosity uh, I went ahead and checked all of the resistors in the tremolo as well all of those were uh, within tolerance uh, check this spray capacitor over here it's doing its job uh, there's no there's absolutely no voltage on the other side of it so it's a perfect capacitor uh, but if you come over here let's see let's turn this up a little bit that is the foot switch socket So by shorting it, uh, I can get the tremolo to start working. So the tremolo actually does work. So there's a problem with the foot switch. Uh, let's take a look at the foot switch, and we'll also look at the look at the plug for the foot switch. And I think let's see, this plug can only go one direction. I think I see the problem. I'm thinking it's I, I'm thinking it's on this end. Um, but let's take a look at it. What we'll do is just hook up, let's see here, which which goes where. I think it's these two wider ones that are the leads for the tremolo. 
Um, okay, so we're getting a three meg. We're getting a three meg reading right there. Let's, let's hit the switch and see what happens. Okay, that's open lead. Three megs. Open lead. Huh. It should go from actually open lead to a closed, to a pretty low resistance, not three megs. So we've got something, something's going on for sure. So it is working, but not the way it should be. So let's see what's going on with that. I think it's, again, I think it's in this end. So what we'll have to do um, is pry this off and s make sure these connections are properly connected the way we're going to do that. And actually, let's not work over the top of the sand. Let's turn the sand off. Kill the power so we don't electrocute ourselves on accident. Let's see here. We'll just peel these back and see what we have here. Tied up in here. All right, so that's the grounded one right there. And actually, these two get, I think the white one and the grounded one, these two right here get tied together inside the other side of the switch. So it actually might be the switch might be the switch itself. I don't see anything obviously messed up there. That all looks nice and clean actually. So let's put this back together and check the other end of the switch. Okay, yeah, the problem problem is definitely in this switch. Uh, taking it out of there and I mean half the time it doesn't even click when you press it. It's got so much gunk down in it but you can twist it and finally get it to click but um, there's just so much garbage and gunk down in there from just decades of, you know, being stomped on that it's just gone. But that's what happens to these. You know, they get moisture down inside there. Um, and they get, you know, little bits of crud down in there that work their way down. And just after a while, it'll no longer see there. There it went clicked. But they'll barely even click after a while. So that's what happens. The switches. I actually had a direct replacement for this uh, for this switch already in stock. This is this is a new old stock switch, and it's made by the same company, even I believe. In there, so yeah, that's cool. That'll fit right in. Okay, that seems to have taken care of our tremolo issue. All right, here we are back with this thing, and um, I had a conversation with the owner of it, and uh, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, we could leave it as is, and it would probably be a good sounding amplifier. Uh, there's a couple improvements that could be made, though. Um, if we notice, the uh, on-off switch is on the treble switch. The problem with that is, look how far away that is from the other power stuff, um, including the neon light and the uh, fuse holder I mean all that stuff is way the hell over here so um, and if you look inside you actually have the here's the AC wires coming in here that have to go all the way through that conduit there all the way down to this switch I mean look how f freaking far that is really not a good design I don't know what you know Gibson man Gibson. I mean, this wasn't made by Gibson. This is a product of CMI Electronics in uh, Lincolnwood, Illinois. But still, 
I mean, Gibson must have signed off on this design, you know, or they maybe even designed it themselves. Um, I mean, they've got this whole power rail thing going, just like Gibson amplifiers. I think they're using a lot of the same sorts of components. All these um, types of capacitors are all... I mean, it looks like a Gibson build, more or less. I think it was just done in a different factory. So, I really don't understand what in what on earth they're thinking with this. I mean, you're likely to induce all kinds of hum like this. So you're You're going across your reverb circuit, you're going across your tremolo circuit, you're, I mean, not to mention putting the switch, and you've done this so that you can, why? So you can put the switch on the back of the treble knob, uh, which is like one of the most, I mean, it's right there in the tone stack. Uh, you know, I don't know. Anyway, we're going to move this. Um, that's the goal anyway. We're going to just uh, replace this pot. Um, and move the switch uh, over to this area. I'm not really sure yet uh, exactly where would be best to put it. I could replace the fuse um, and do it that way or I could drill another hole. I honestly think that drilling another hole makes a little bit more sense. Um, you know, maybe somebody though in the future might want to restore this back or something. So, it's possible we could uh, put the switch where the fuse currently sits and just do like an internal fuse instead. Um, or we could eliminate the lights and do it that way. I don't know. Which makes probably a little bit more sense. It would, it would be a little bit easier, really, to just eliminate that light and then maybe do something else for a light instead of that so the more I think about that that might be actually a better idea and maybe even move the light like I don't know I don't know but then again you could just put this if you're gonna move the light anyway you might as well put the switch up there um, so yeah I mean he's basically said you know I trust your judgment on this sort of thing um, and with this being a Kalamazoo I, I mean it's not really a particularly collectible amp uh, to begin with, so I mean, it's not like we're, I don't think we're going to be destroying the value of anything, you know, overly collectible by doing any of this. At the same time, I do like to keep things um, as original as possible, but I mean, this is just a piss poor design. I don't know what they were smoking, what they were snorting, <laughs> what kind of PCP they were on. I, I have no idea. Um, but they were definitely doing some, some good shit because <laughs> this is. This is just madness. This is like schizophrenia. I, I, why you would do this? I'm mean, on the treble. They didn't even bring it over to like the volume, you know, where you turn it on. Oh, let's keep going. And then we've got volume. No, it's on the treble. So who the hell knows? Maybe it was just, you know, they, the treble pot is probably a different value. And for, for whatever reason, they had a bunch of this value pot with a switch on the back. And we've got to use those, man, you know, because we've already got them in the warehouse or something. That's probably what that's about. Um, I'm guessing, but still just a stupid, stupid design, stupid way to get rid of parts, you know, to run all that conduit over. Anyway, end of rant. Let's uh, finish this thing up. Uh, I'll figure something out and we'll come back to it.